Baptist Church. I don't know what camera to look at, but good morning to you. We're glad that you're, you're tuning in via live stream. We'll be doing this uh, for, for the foreseeable future, so you make sure you tune in with us. Make sure that you're still uh, following along. We're planning on doing uh, many of the services like this. Uh, so um, we're safe here. We're good here. Uh, we love you guys and praying for you guys. I, I hope that you'll go ahead and join in wherever you are via the live stream. Join in. Stand on up to your feet. Let's get, it, get started with some praise and worship. Here we go. So we're going to start off with this song, Cornerstone. Sing it with us. Here we go. My hope is built. Blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Sing that again. My hope is built.
and we just want to recognize you as we move throughout our week we want to be careful to start with you our every dependence is on you our faith is in you Lord in Christ alone so Lord we just want to pause and take time even with this being different kind of a service you are the same you are the same God so Lord will declare that in every situation until your soon return Lord we love you for us in Christ's name we pray we thank thee amen Hey, we have one more song for you, so I hope that you're, it's a little different here, yeah, uh, without you guys participating with us, but you know what? Our praise is not to you, our praise is to our Father in heaven, amen? amen. So hopefully you're sitting there with your family, you're standing there with your family and joining in with praise because regardless of where you are, we're singing to our Father in heaven. We got one more song for you. Holy is the Lord. with us, lift up your hands as you sing this song. Father, we love you. And you are holy. Here we go. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Lift it up. 
Praise the Lord. So I want to I want to really thank want to really thank the praise team, and uh, you know I got to give them props again. They have been here for two and a half hours already in order for us to get this all together, and I find myself on another Sunday being challenged uh, to see if I can raise you know the preaching to the level of, of praise that God gives us here. So. Praise the Lord for the uh, praise team. I want to thank them for being here and doing this. And that will not be, Lord willing, that will be not be the only time you see them. And even within a week, uh, we have a complete plan. We have a, we have a family worship plan. Uh, we have a Feed the Soul prayer service plan. We have a Harvest Kids plan for your kids. Every one of our adult classes are going to have their plan and the youth have their plan. And uh, part of the prayer plan is that you will be seeing our, our pastors take, uh, the th take a, a different day, so a different pastor each day of the week. Uh, to do the prayer diary, which I put together every week for our church, and a different pastor will take the panel for that day and pray us through it, and also say a word or two maybe about the um, about the Bible reading schedule that is on there. But on Thursdays, uh, starting a week from this Thursday, then the praise team is going to take uh, that Thursday panel, and they're going to submit the hymn that we're going to do. And on top of that, you know, maybe give us uh, you know give us a taste, uh, uh, you know, so you'll get to see the praise team even in the midst of the week and uh, praise the Lord for that and uh, you know I think that is that's what we have to do as a church and I you know I understand everybody's saying well you know the church isn't the building anyway and we always knew that the, as Baptists we always knew that the church is not the building the church is not also is also not online the church is a gathering because Jesus said where even just two or three are gathered in his name he's there so what that means is we really can't have online church, but we can have an online service where you can have family worship in your home. You can invite other people to come in and watch with you. You can get that two or three together or as many as might come. And so here's what I'm asking God for, and I know that you'll be praying with me on this. I know that this, we're going to be united and we're going to have our wrists locked together in prayer on this. Because uh, what we're going to be praying for is that this is going to be a great time of harvest. So rather than focusing on the fear, rather than focusing, uh, you know, what, you know, all the problems, everything that may be coming on us. And, and we know there are issues people are going to be facing. I mean, as far as we can tell, this is just this may uh, destroy the new world order and the new world order may end up becoming the old world order and uh, press total reset on what an economy even is. And OK, all of that's out there. I understand that. So let's rise above that to God's level and let's look down and let's uh, let's take that and let's count on God to give us a great time of harvest and even you. And those that your family can meet and touch and invite and, uh, you know, so really uh, HBC isn't just Harvest Baptist Church anymore. HBC is for Harvest Baptist Community. And our hashtag is HBC Hope because I think we're going to, you know, we're going to be a community of faith, love, hope, and love. And I think that the, what the world needs most right now is hope. And so we're going to emphasize that because we can deliver it. 
So all the handouts for what we're going to talk about today will, are available also online, uh, as well as I think the normal bulletin that we would have with various prayer requests and things like that. Normally we would take up an offering, and so, so you know, if you want to give even though we are not gathering, then you can do that on our website at the button there, or you can mail it in uh, to the address of the church, you can uh, text to give. Uh, even as far as that goes. So, so we'll let you do that. So I'm going to pray, and, I, and I'll pray for the offering that you know, you're also going to give online, as well as just lead us in prayer uh, before we get into the passage we're going to look at today. Father, I thank you again, Lord, for your mercies to us. Um, God, you haven't given up on us yet. We're still here. So help us, Lord, not to give up on you. I pray that you'd bless, once again, every person who's about to give, particularly those who had any income. Lord, you're still calling us to tithe, just as you have done all our life. And so, Father, we, we dedicate that to you because our pastors are still pastoring, our ministers are still ministering, our deacons are still serving, our worship team is still singing, our, you know, th- uh, uh, life is going to go on and in such a way that, Lord, as you allow us, We will invite those who have things they can donate to come here and those who have needs to come and get it. And Lord, we want to be part of all of that with you. And Lord, two weeks ago, we didn't didn't know you'd give us such a mighty opportunity. But Jesus says, we are the light of the world. So one of two things is now going to happen, God. Either, Either the devil is going to get us to hide underneath a bushel or else... By him trying to stomp out our fire, our sparks are simply going to fly further, bringing light into the minds that have been blinded by darkness. Lord, how many people do we know that we've prayed for, we've witnessed to? They've always been either so apathetic or so hard. And Lord, you're giving us a time that could be a time of such great harvest. And Lord, two weeks ago, we were the church gathered. On Sunday night, Sundays and Wednesdays especially, and now we're the church scattered. So Lord, help us to gather where we are scattered, just like Earth's earliest disciples in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 and 4. So Lord, remember, we, we have nothing to prove here. You have everything to prove. I mean, big church, little church, mega church, doesn't matter anymore. But God, you have everything to prove So we acknowledge today you are calling us to reclaim your reputation in the eyes of the lost by being ready to share your grace, by being prepared with your strength so that we can serve others because of your peace. So Lord, I pray, help us connect Christ to as many people as possible and create a beautiful day each Sunday for us, filled with faith, hope, and love. First, for your family as, we, as, we, as we're as we able to direct people in family worship, but then also for their friends, their neighbors, their, the co-workers that they can reach. We ask these things in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Amen. You know, it's really a strange thing how we find healing and strength whenever we worship together. And that is a serious advantage to crave now that we are in what seems to be increasingly perilous times. And so what I feel like is with this series that we've been doing in Hebrews chapter 11, God has perfectly pre-positioned us for everything that he plans for us to do during this crisis on the way out to the other side. So since January, we've been fasting 16 hours a day and just eating eight hours a day. And, and, and our Sunday night Feed the Soul prayer service has been well attended. What a sweet spirit of, of praise and of prayer. And so those will continue online. And so I believe God has used this spiritually to prepare us this year just for such a time as this. Our office, you know, has long ago embraced technology that allows us to provide a remote network for spiritual connectedness. And what we discover is that this task is uh, way too big for any soul that remains bound by fear or bound by doubt. So we need to dive deep into a life that suspends 
disbelief of God and suspends its skepticism in the Bible so that it can increase its faith. And it stretches our resource all the way to where we ought to be reasoning so that we're thinking right because you're supplying us and we're looking at what you are giving us. And so as we look at the characters highlighted here in Hebrews chapter 11, Paul boils down the life of each individual down to this epic example, just kind of a moment of conflict and decision where they are forced to look past the visible and into the reality beyond. But now, if you'll turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11, with Abraham, because he is the father of the faith for Jew and Gentile alike, God takes us even deeper, even further into the story. And in Abraham, we find a unique place of resource because we're invited to live our lives within the blessing of God. And that's even if we have to go back to living in a tent sometime. But since circumstances may not have you following me yet, can I give you an experiential exegesis of blessing? Because a lot of people are uncomfortable with the word blessing right now uh, because they think it, it is negated by the hard and harsh realities of the observable, material, and unpredictable world. And so first off, notice if you will, we tend to call a blessing, and this is number one, over our food. And I can admit, that can feel kind of overdone and overused and, and maybe even superficial now. I always thought of, you know, praying for your food as kind of a faith version of on your market, set, go. And that way anybody at the table doesn't have an advantage over any other. And yet for the believer uh, to pray, uh, to thank God for what he's given us is an acknowledgement of God's activity. It's, it's an answer to the prayer for daily bread, which, you know, we can plant the seed for that bread, but we cannot guarantee its harvest. So second, on the other hand, we call for a blessing over someone, and this is number two, when they sneeze. And uh, this is more important to us within the last month. You know, we have a church response plan to the coronavirus, and it's, it, is a, it is a church plan, it is a personal plan for you, and it is a spiritual plan. If you didn't get that email, check for it online at hbcbluesprings.org slash safety, and then create a My HBC account so that you get our emails. Because even people who do not believe in God say God bless you when somebody sneezes. Or if they're consistent with their atheism, they just cut God out and say bless you. And then in the final analysis, blessing is really, and this is number three, resourcing. And that is the language in the story today because it is centered around the desire and the intention of God to bless Abraham by grace and then bless all other nations through him. And so this third concept cannot remain with us some superficial, abstract, ethereal category. In order for it to touch us, it's got to be real. So here's our thesis for today's study. What, what it means to be blessed is to understand God is the source of everything that is good. He is the source of life and love by his grace, strength, and peace. God is brimming and erupting with kindness and goodness for us at all times and in all places. So he creates us to live within the sphere of that goodness. We were deceived by Satan once upon a time into believing that apart from God, we could do a lot better. So we vacated that original space and place of God's goodness, where God's blessing was just the natural resource of our lives. And now the story of Abraham shows us a person who makes choices to put himself and his family in the place to receive the blessing of God and be counted an heir by doing it. So let me take you to our text. Hebrews chapter 11, when, when you look at all the problems, when you dwell on the present crisis, when you see all the despair and emptiness, I mean, it'd be really easy to ask, if there is a God, why doesn't he intervene? 
I mean, if God is good, why didn't he do something? And what this passage draws us into, and this is our first point for study, is how God is determined to bring us to an eternal destiny and for us to bring the gospel good news of redemption to the world. That is how God's love flows through the human story from the beginning of the Bible till now and on. It is to have forgiveness and eternal life come into the lives of men and women who will receive his grace by faith. So, verse 8, Hebrews 11. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whither he went. Now this is how every epic story begins. I mean, they all begin with an adventure into the unknown. Guess what? That is exactly where we're at right now. And you can either view it skeptically and be embroiled and bound by fear, or you can view it believingly and say, wow, this is an epic adventure into the unknown with God. So what we see, and this is our second point for study, is that you need to learn what you know because of the God you know. God says, move on my word and let it open to you a new world of experience. Maybe a depth of spirituality you've never known, a revival that you've never had. Have a worship-driven life by your expression of a worship-driven faith. So let me take you to Genesis chapter 12. You may want to keep Hebrews 11 in your right hand, Genesis 12 in your left hand. We'll kind of be flipping back and forth because this is the backstory to our story. What we find in Genesis 11 verse 31 is that it was Abraham's father Terah who started the journey out of Ur, kingdom of the Chaldeans. Uh, But when they got to Haran, they stopped, and Terah didn't make it. So now God intervenes, and he extends an invitation to Abraham. Notice verse 1, Genesis 12. Now the Lord God had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. I want you to enter the space where you are the recipient of my blessing. I want you to have a great name, become a great people, and bless the world. But you know, I can't do that if you don't follow me into the unknown by having a worship-driven faith. So leave everything behind and go with me to the land I promise. You know, for so many of us, our life just perfectly parallels the story of Terah and Abraham. Some people are Terah. They get saved, and yet they only get so far. And they end their life short of the full blessing that God wants to bring to them. And while they're part of the family, I mean, they came out of Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, They never made it to the promised land. And so in the end, at the judgment seat of Christ, they do not receive the inheritance. And maybe that's you today. You're not not where you used to be, but you're not where you should be. You stopped short of the spot of full blessing. For some of you, your parents thought the most important thing was to get you to church. And so compared to others, you grew up in church. And you got to church, but you never got to Jesus. Or you attended the monument built around Jesus, but you never connected to the movement inspired by Jesus. And so you went from the rank paganism of the Chaldees. And their name means clodhoppers. I mean, how hick, how, how much more hillbilly can you get than that? Er of the clodhoppers. And they went all the way to belief at Haran, which means their mountain. So now you've made your molehill into a mountain. So you had this one-time experience, but you never moved past belief into a daily living faith. Abraham shows us that for you to inherit the promise of God, for you to live in the blessing of God, 
for you to become the conduit of God's grace, strength, and the peace of God to the world, you have to make this one decision up front. You have to leave your comfort and you have to surrender everything and you follow. And oh, by the way, no GPS. I'm not going to tell you when this is going to stop. I'm not going to tell you how long for the lockdown. I'm not going to tell you when normal returns until after you start walking and then you move into worshiping. Watch verse 6, Genesis 12, verse 6. And Abram passed through the land of the place of Sychem unto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto thee, Thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Canaanite was in the land. You know, I, I don't know, COVID-19, you know, was in the land. He, but he built his altar right there because that was what was promised to him. I mean, how many of us, we want to experience the fullness of a relationship with God. And we read about these extraordinary individuals, either in the Bible or in missionary stories, these people who have had these amazing experiences with God. And our own life is so mundane and ordinary and average, or was until two weeks ago. But you know, average is not the normal Christian life, and neither is fear. Because if you're in a relationship with God, you're supposed to experience the fullness of God. Your life should be like Hebrews 11. And yet, and this is my third point for study, you can be an heir of God's promise and still not live in the place, space, and posture where those promises become real for you. Has that been you up until now? This happens when you claim the promise without fulfilling the premise. The premise is the surrender to build a worship-driven life. So how do you know, how do you really know when faith is driving your life? How do you know when you're walking the path of mystery and yet certainty because of the word of God? How do you know that you are in the space of God's blessing and moving toward the place of all God's promises for you in Christ? Well, first off, I need you to know faith is driving your life. And this is number one. When your worship is surrender to God's eternal purpose. Back in Hebrews 11, look at verse 9. By faith, Abraham sojourned in the land of promise is in a strange country. I mean, it doesn't sound like a promised land, being a strange country, doesn't sound like promised land, the Canaanite being in the land, but you know, that really parallels your Christian life. This world is not our home, and yet it is after Christ comes back. So we are strangers and pilgrims right now, but we will be heirs and rulers later. Verse 9, dwelling in tabernacles. That's tense. With Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. I mean, they lived in tents and we may start living in tents soon. I, I don't know. But, but, but his decision affected the life, lives of his son and his grandsons. I mean, why would he do that? All the way through this chapter, we've seen this refrain about how it's necessary for us to see the invisible and act on the unseen. Verse 10, for he looked for a city which hath foundations. I mean, not like the cities we live in. Ones that don't get shaken. I mean, we're in the time of a, really a tsunami, a, an earthquake. Well, the earth itself isn't moving, but everything is moving. And, and it's like you have no foundation. That's okay. We know it's, it may not show up here. Abraham looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So first he had to surrender and walk away from the city he could see. He had to turn away from everything he could see outside of God. But then there was this relentless pursuit of a promised inheritance, unseen and invisible now, and yet real and eternal. 
And this is God's destiny for your life. A lot of people turn to Jesus because they mess up their life and they want God to fix it. But now this is my fourth point for study. When you come to God only because you need him to fix your life, then you just get angry with God when it doesn't get easier or better. I mean, if that's the only reason you're coming to him, is just because of Christ's crisis, but not to walk through with him through it, then you're just going to get mad at God because you came to him and then it didn't get better. And I'll admit a lot of TV preachers make you feel like when you come to God, oh, you get happier and healthier and richer. I mean, I've watched them on, you know, clips of them on TV just this last week, you know, and they're saying, well, you know, healing's in the atonement. I don't need to worry about this virus. And, you know, they make you think when you come to Jesus, you become successful, taller, and better looking. You know, many times when you surrender to God, it doesn't look like blessing at all. If you are not looking beyond all the way to the unseen. And so throughout this chapter, the constant refrain has been, these ancients of the faith are applauded by God and presented as our model so that they can become the ancients, we can become the ancients of the future along with them because they saw the invisible and we're walking to the same invisible that we see with them. Why is seeing the unseen so important? It's because of the insane, unexplainable tragedies and viruses and pandemics. It's because of the diseases and accidents. They force us to look beyond or else be lost in despair. So these ancient elders move from lives of safety and security and certainty to a life of human uncertainty and external instability. And here's my fifth point for study. Because we are living in a day when there's no good news to prop you up on the outside, you need a structure on the inside. I'm just saying, that structure comes from the gospel good news and a worship-driven faith. And it not only allows you to survive, it draws other, others into eternal life with you and into God's destiny for eternity. The place of struggle was the place of promise. And by moving, Abraham became the heir of all God's blessing. So second, on the other hand, faith is driving your life. And this is number two, when your worship is relentless pursuit of God's kingdom. Because in God's kingdom, you inherit a world of blessing. Are you in that pursuit, being in that place and on that journey where all the inheritable blessings of God's kingdom are yours. Back in Genesis 12, verse 2 tells us, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. God says, ambition is spiritual if you desire to be great in order to be a great blessing. And Jesus chimes in from the Gospels and says, You know, if you ain't faithful starting with little, if you are not faithful starting with exactly what you have right now, if you are ungrateful and do not use what I've already given you, do not expect to be given more and become great. Verse 3, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. God is looking for people. He is looking for us. He is looking for this church the church that used to be gathered in two services on Sunday mornings and now is scattered and gathering together in multiple places on Sunday mornings. He's looking for us to say to him, God, you want to make someone great? I will surrender. I will leave my fear behind in order to relentlessly pursue this inheritance that you promise, even though it is as yet unseen. God, I want you to do something great with us. So the third layer of faith 
is driving your life. And this is number three, when an heir comes from your own discipleship. Back in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11 says, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of his child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. In Genesis 17, God changes Abraham's name based on a promise I mean, his birth name was Abram, which means exalted father, uh, which seemed like a mockery at the moment because he was as good as dead. And many of us feel the same way at the moment. So God makes, makes him an object of ridicule even further because he changes his name to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. You know, this is at the time when nation states were just beginning to form back in 1921 B.C. So Abraham had this promise as these nation states formed that he would be the father of a great nation which would bless all the other nations just right then starting. Hebrews 11 verse 12 says, Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. You know, today they tell us there are two trillion observable galaxies, and that is why you cannot count the stars. And God says to us, you're so focused on this one problem, and I'm trying to get you to see your eternal destiny. So the same thing is said in three places in the New Testament. Romans 4, Galatians 3, and James chapter 2, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him. Romans says, counted unto him. Galatians says, accounted unto him for righteousness. But Abraham is such a perfect mirror of the life of every Christian because it was really hard for Abraham to believe for a long time. I mean, for a long time, it was just hard to believe. And now he's 100, his wife is 90 and not interested. So when the angel of the Lord appeared in Genesis 18 to tell her that she was going to become pregnant, she just laughed. And you know, the reason Sarah laughed is because she was standing behind Abraham in the tent, sitting on, she was sitting on the bed. So when she heard that, I mean, she's sitting on the bed and she just laughed because she knew that sex was necessary to, to have pregnancy. And yet she had not just been through menopause. I mean, she was at menostop. <laughs> so every time they started to have sex, they just laughed. And, 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 you know, and when she looked under those covers, she just laughed. And it's like, hey, you know, you know, it's still working, but I don't know if this is going to work. And, and this couple is so much a common picture of normal us. I mean, it's hard to believe God over a really long time when you don't have an end date or an end point and you don't know when it's going to stop and you get impatient. So you don't act by faith, but you act by feelings in the flesh. But in the final analysis, the most difficult thing, and this is number four, is the call to live faithfully according to the promise. It's hard when God does not come through like we prayed for him to. And God's not on time like we want him to be. And it's hard to keep the faith and live in line with biblical authority, and yet... Hebrews 11 verse 13 says, These all died in faith, having not received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly they seek a country, a city with foundations, which is therefore secure, a country with no viruses, an unseen country. Abraham knew God was faithful, and that's why he trusted him. 
He saw beyond to the unseen, and that's why he trusted him. But now here's the dealio. It's our sixth point for study. The moment you stop believing that God is faithful and that his word is authoritative, you stop being faithful to God. And that is the reason for the sad stories that follow. In chapter 20 of Genesis, he lies and he makes his wife lie. In chapter 21, there's a fatal final fracture between Ishmael and Isaac. That is the reason Abraham spends many days backslidden in the Philistines' land. Chapter 21, verse 34. And that is the reason for the absolute necessity of chapter 22. When you're unfaithful to God, it's because you do not believe God's been faithful to you. So here's the corollary to the principle contained in point six. This is our seventh point for study. The only proof you believe in God is faithfulness when you being faithful, when you live faithfully for him. The only, only way you are showing and confessing that you believe God is faithful is when you live faithfully for him. Because of disease and pandemic, because the world is in disarray now as well as darkness. You know, it's easy to walk on in darkness whenever you're not bumping into anything. And you can think you're on the right path, uh, you know, as long as you don't hit anything. But now we've got violence and evil and corruption prevailing and we naturally ask the question, where is God in this? How can God care if he allows this? So let me say the most important thing that you'll hear. In light of this present distress, God wants us to reclaim his reputation in the eyes of the lost. To reclaim his reputation in the eyes of the world. And even if God gave us endless blessings, we wouldn't give him the credit. How do I know? Because we haven't been. I mean, we would take credit for the blessing and then just keep blaming God for the bad. Hebrews 11 verse 15 says, And truly, if they had been mindful of that country whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So the way God solves a problem and reclaims his reputation is by looking for men and women who will be the new Abraham and Sarah. And it's interesting to me this time we're going through, it is the older people among us who are, you know, told to be most cautious, and that's good and that's true and do that, and yet at the same time, God takes the old, one of the older couples in the Bible and calls them to surrender to him and pursue his agenda, agenda and ensure an heir through discipleship and live faithfully according to his word. Then he makes them the heirs of his blessing so that his reputation can be reestablished in the world by his grace, strength, and peace which is seen. So God brings Abraham and Sarah. God brings you and me all the way to Genesis 22. So look with me here in Hebrews 11, but be getting Genesis 22 now in your left hand. Hebrews 11, verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So God tells Abraham, go build an altar and offer the life of of your beloved son, your only begotten son, in sacrifice on Mount Moriah. And you know, we think of Isaac as an infant or just a little boy. But Isaac was 24 years old. I mean, he just graduated from graduate school. Genesis 22 verse 4 tells us, Then on the third day, after three days... Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Isaac was as good as dead. The son was as good as dead to the father for three days. 
And Isaac had been a part of building altars and worship all his life. So he asks a basic fundamental question. Look, um, Dad, I see that you have the fire and you have the knife. Uh, I'm carrying the wood, but didn't we forget the sacrifice? And it does not say that Isaac tried to escape or run for his life or wrestle for his freedom. I mean, his father was 124 years old. So Isaac must have been a willing sacrifice. And everything in Abraham is shaking with fear. And everything he knew about God was being questioned in that circumstance. And his soul was filled with confusion. But that confusion was overwhelmed by the truth of God that he had learned over a lifetime of already surrendering everything, already pursuing relentlessly, relentlessly, already ensuring a disciple and living faithfully despite his faults. It all led to this moment. So all he could reply to his son Isaac was verse 8 of Genesis 22. My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together. And when you turn back over and look at Hebrews chapter 11 with me, Hebrews 11 gives us this insight. And verse 19 tells us that, he, that Abraham was accounting that God was able to raise his son up even from the dead. From whence also he received him in a figure, in a type. So just before the final stroke, just before that fatal life-ending blow, after he had already made the choice to obey based on the invisible destiny he could see, God restrains the hand of Abraham. But he did not restrain his own hand. The hand of the Father against the beloved, only begotten Son, Jesus, who was appointed as the sacrifice for your sins. Genesis 22, verse 13 tells us, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram, caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead, in the place, as a substitute for his son. Why didn't God allow Abraham to literally slay Isaac? Because Isaac was a type. He was an Old Testament type, just a foreshadowing of what God would really do with his son, Jesus, and what he does with his sons, us. You say, Alan, oh, I don't like that plot twist. I mean, I was hanging with you this whole sermon until you said that. And that's, that's a plot twist I didn't see coming. That's kind of, you know, M. Night Shalaman or whoever. I, uh, what do you mean? What do you mean that he spared Isaac, but he didn't spare his son and he doesn't spare his sons? What do you mean by that? Well, if you happen to have your hand out in some way, either you printed it off or you can see it online, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 tells us, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, we know he's good all the time, regardless of circumstances happening around us, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And that provides us the complete picture how one day Jesus Christ would be given as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world and also how we must do our only reasonable worship duty of offering our own bodies just like Isaac did because Isaac was a living sacrifice unto God. When Isaac and Abraham grabbed that male lamb, that ram, which is a male lamb, they knew God had always been planning to bless them and be the source of the sacrifice all along because God resources your sacrifice with his blessing. Why did God bring Abraham to Moriah after everything else he'd been through? Well, the same reason that you go from wealth to poverty, from health to sickness, from confidence to fear, because this is the disciples' journey of faith in order to make heirs 
of the promise. We are the surrenderers to God's eternal purpose. So we pursue, pursue relentlessly his biblical kingdom. We ensure a holy nation, as 1 Peter 2.9 calls us, of heirs through evangelism and discipleship. And then it all comes full circle while we live faithfully in alignment with his promises. So I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes, even if you're at home and I think the praise team is going to make their way uh, kind of coming back up so they can lead us in a song here at the end. But, you know, God says everything I've given you, everything that you could come to love more than me, everything that might hold you back from your eternal destiny and could keep you from the complete blessing to come, God says, I want you to surrender it all again. Abraham learned that life is this beautiful circle that Jesus said it was of surrendering everything and receiving everything, of giving up our life and gaining worlds beyond. That is what getting saved really means. It's not an intellectual assent to truth. It is a faith response, which means an exchange of life. Your old sinful, rotten life for the new, righteous, righteous, spotless life of Christ and giving up your life to gain his eternal life today. And by doing that, you become alive by his life. And there is no virus that can ever touch that. So if you want that today, will you just pray with me right now? If you want your life to continue with God after death, then you must follow Jesus right now. So just talk to God. Just pray right now and say, God, save me for Jesus' sake. I want to belong to you. Jesus, I give you my life. I see it now. You've spoken to my heart. I'm ashamed that it took all of this, that you had to bring us all to this. But the Holy Spirit's now taken away the blindness that I had before this moment. Jesus, you were God's lamb dying on the old wooden cross for me. So I trust Jesus today for eternal life. You know, if you prayed that prayer, will you call, text, or email us? And let us know, because I want to get you a copy of my book on next steps for new believers. If you started the journey, but you somewhere stopped along the way, start again. Start again with us. These Sundays, these Sunday nights, these Wednesday nights, daily in the times we can share together technologically and online, start living by a worship-driven faith. Surrender again. Living sacrifice again. Let's pray. Father, I pray that there are men and women today who believe you are the God who earnestly longs to bless us to bless us with eternal life and righteousness, that you are abounding in love. You're willing to bestow grace, strength, and peace to serve. There's so much blessing that you want to bring to the lost, and you're wanting us to be the vessel to minister that to them. So God, if nobody else is all in, I am. God, I want to be an heir of the promise. And if nobody else wants it, I want theirs too. This week, fill us with your spirit so that we can start becoming the blessing to the lost at this time that we ought to be. So that we can do that, whether it's to two or three at a time or ten at a time or whatever the case may be. And Lord, be with us next Sunday when we would have shared the Lord's Supper together. Lord, help us to be together in our online service that can be turned into a family worship plan and our midweek in the Word and our daily devotional time and weekly missionary minute we're going to have and feed the soul prayer service Sunday nights and the Harvest Kid plan for children and for their parents and the HBC Hope. 
for our church family and the community. For we ask these things in the precious and the powerful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We'll close you out with one more, one more uh, chorus of Holy is the Lord. Here we go. One. Glory.